Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner, and our engineer is Anita Brockington. Tonight, we are talking about a subject we know mainly from science fiction movies, but it's entering the everyday very rapidly, so it's time to educate ourselves. We are talking about nano technology. Those tiny little robots with artificial intelligence with a billion different applications and the plot of dozens of movies where they take over the world. Our guest tonight, Frank Beam, will be our guide as we focused almost exclusively on the medical applications of nanotechnology. Frank Beam's 769-page book is called Nano Medical Device and Systems Design, Challenges, Possibilities, Visions, and he's joining us for the next two hours to share his passion for the next huge leap in health care. It's no secret that Americans are suffering from a broken health care system and It's getting worse. Costs continue to escalate, while the overall health of Americans continues to decline. The American lifestyle causes us to get fat and to live sicker and die quicker than folks in other industrialized countries around the world. Obesity alone accounts for 21% of all health care costs, and that's with the current incidence of obesity in the United States to be about 34% of adults. And by the year 2030, if trends continue, over half of Americans will be obese, as Pogo the Possum, the cartoon character, character created by Walt Kelly, And he was famous for saying, we have met the enemy, and he is us. One ray of of hope for a future less bleak than the one predicted by current trends is the advance in nanomedicine. Developments in nanotechnology have not only led to sharper and less invasive surgical tools, infinitely improved drug targeting to precise disease sites and enhanced surgical tools, but they are coming at costs that should make them available to all. Star Trek-like concepts are entering the field of medicine at an accelerating pace and here to report on some of the latest research developments is Frank Beam. Frank Beam has been involved with nanotechnology and especially nanomedicines since 1995. He serendipitously encountered the concept of nanotechnology on the Internet and immediately became fascinated with its virtually limitless potential, particularly as it relates to the field of medicine. He passionately proceeded to autodidactically absorb knowledge on almost every aspect of nanotechnology and nanomedicine, and that means he taught himself and began to evolve advanced concepts and designs for near-term and long-term nanomedical components, devices, and systems. And in 2009, Frank founded and serves as CEO for the startup NanoApps Medical, that's N-A, which aims to investigate and develop advanced and cost-effective nanomedical devices and systems for the benefit of both the developing and developed worlds and to facilitate human space travel in 2013. He generated his first book entitled Nanomedical Device and Systems Design, Challenges and Possibilities, Visions, CRC Press, and he is now in the process of generating two new books in parallel to articulate his larger vision of where nanotechnology, nanomedicine, and artificial intelligence may lead, entitled Nanotechnology, Nanomedicine, and Artificial Intelligence Toward the Dream of Global Healthcare. 
equivalency and molecular manufacturing, emergence of the grand equalizer. A third book entitled Nanomedical Brain Cloud Interface, Explorations and Implications is also in the works which will investigate the possibilities of hypothetical, for now, nanomedically enabled brain cloud interface. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Frank Bean. Hello, Dr. Bob. Thank you very much, and uh, pleased to meet you, and uh, I appreciate you having me on your show. Well, we certainly appreciated going through your 769 pages. <laughs> that was quite some challenge. I saw well, words... thank you very much for the effort. <laughs> I saw... I saw words I've never seen before. <laughs> well, don't worry. I had to work, I had to look them up myself before I wrote them down. <laughs> so but you're it, fine. It was, it was some experience, I'll tell you. I really enjoyed it. So how did Actually, you get... Before we go on, I'd like to... Uh, I just was reading that you started uh, tw- uh, your radio, 21st Century Radio, back in 1988. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, so happy belated 30th anniversary. Oh, thank you. On thank your, you. Fascinating programming, and you're doing a lot to stimulate the uh, human intellect. You're, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Yes, it's you're been welcome. it's been one long struggle. I mean, oh yeah, <laughs> we've been time. there thirty some years, and uh, in the thirty second year, actually thirty third, and uh, it has been a, an interesting experience to see how how this location in Baltimore has been altered. Yes by this kind of technology or, or, or this information. Now, let's get to what is nanotechnology and nanomedicine, and how did you get involved in these areas? Okay, well, uh, let's start with nanotechnology. Uh, it is the capacity control to controllably manipulate matter at the atomic and molecular levels. So this scale range we're talking about is typically at the range from 1 to 100 nanometers. That's where all the magic kind of, so to speak, happens. So to give you a sense of this scale, one micron is a millionth of a meter, one nanometer is a billionth of a meter, and you would be able to fit 100,000 nanometers in the width of a human hair, just to give you a kind of a a graphic on that. Whoa, that's quite a graphic you gave us. (laughs) How much did you say that? 100,000 nanometers in the width of a human hair. Whoa. Typical human hair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So our DNA is two nanometers in diameter, and you could probably fit five to ten atoms in one nanometer. So depending on the size of the atom, uh, hydrogen atoms are like 0.5 nanometers in diameter, so you'd be able to fit ten of those in a row, and that would equal a nanometer. So we're talking very, 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 very small. Very small, yeah. Now, now what makes nanotechnology and nanomedicine so unique? Well, okay, I'll just uh, kind of go through uh, how I came across this. I was, as you said, I came across it on the Internet. I was just fascinated with all the possibilities, uh, especially in uh, how uh, it might be applied to medicine. Then I uh, started researching all the, the people that were involved in this, and I came across this book called Engines of Creation by Dr. Eric Drexler, who actually a lot of people call the godfather of uh, data technology because he, he popularized it. Uh, prior to him was Richard Frame, uh, Feynman. He actually gave a talk at, uh, in 1959 that kind of described making smaller machines with bigger machines down to the, the micro scale. So that was the first kind of instance at, uh, about somebody just articulating what nanotechnology is. So then I read another book by uh, Eric Drexler called Nanosystems, Molecular Machinery, Manufacturing, Computation, which gets into all the technical aspects of how these uh, machines might be made at the, at the micro scale. So then I started just getting very passionate about this. I started reading everything I possibly could on nanotechnology at the time, which was relatively scant compared to now. I can't even keep up with it now. But uh, chemistry, biology electronics, computation, physics, and uh, just started learning everything I possibly could because it's all kind of connected to uh, nanotechnology. And uh, then I had evolved um, concepts for advanced nanomedical devices and connect, started connecting with some of the top heads in the, on the planet on, in this field. 
So another, uh, as far as nanomedicine goes, I connected with uh, Dr. Robert Friedis Jr. He's like the father of nanomedicine. He wrote the first books on the planet concerning nanomedicine. So I connected with him, and he's, in many senses, he was my uh, my mentor because I asked him many, many questions. I probably drove him crazy asking you all these questions. But I was just like a sponge. So uh, he was kind of like my mentor. He gave me lots of insight. So that's how I got into it. Uh, so what makes nanotechnology and nanomedicine unique is it kind of imbues new properties to materials and enhances their properties uh, in comparison to their bulk uh, counterparts. So for instance, you have uh, increased electrical or thermal conductivity or resistance to the same, more sensitivity to light or wavelengths, uh, so the improved conversion of light into electricity like in solar panels, for instance. Also improved uh, catalysts to initiate uh, chemical reactions or um, you can apply it to the environment for um, environmental remediation for you know degrading contaminants in the in the environment and toxins to uh, benign elements. And you could also do things like uh, capture CO2 and convert that into something that's useful, or e even into building products, which would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm, sure. which, in which we need now, I think. <laughs> yeah. oh, really, the sooner the better. Geez, it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm so concerned, and I'm sure you are, too, about this type 2 diabetes. Yes. Uh, and the cost associated with treating these diseases continues to escalate year by year, plus the incidence continues to rise as well. Uh, I was looking at some Absolutely. stats. Uh, consider that in 2016, cardiovascular disease cost the U.S. about 555 billion billion dollars project a lot of clams <laughs> yeah but listen to the clams it was going to cost us in 2035 they figure it's no going kidding. to be 1.1 trillion dollars and that's really wow. a scary trend in the united states is in this it's an, an, an increasing incidence of type 2 diabetes especially amongst children what that's why i i said boy the sooner the better uh because absolutely uh, you know, we all see. We need a lot of help on a lot of fronts. I think right right now. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. We sure do. Uh, so, tell us about. Oh, I think we'll take our break now so that we won't okay. be stopped in the middle of this. And when I come back, you can cheat and and tell and think about telling us about your first book and what the impetus was for writing it. Okay. Sure. All okay. right. We'll be back with our guest, Frank Bean. Nano medical device and systems design challenges, possibilities, visions, CRC Press, available on Amazon.com or from the link on the front page of 21stCenturyRadio.com. This is Carolyn Garcia, also known as Mountain Girl, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Okay. You with us? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. That, the question I had for you was to tell us about your first book and what... Well, yeah, just before we start that, I'd like to kind of go back to the previous question. I had a few more things to add there, if you wouldn't mind. I uh, No, I wouldn't mind at all. The more, the better. Okay, okay cool. So um, there's a thing called the Consumer Products Inventory of uh, products that already have uh, nanotechnology integrated into them. And believe it or not, there are more than 1,600 products on the market today that already incorporate nanotech. So the future is essentially already here. Um, so this ranges from anything from uh, nanotubes in car tires to make them last longer. Um, there are also all kinds of nanomaterials in automotive plastics to actually make them stronger, more pliable, you know, less uh, staticky. And I think they're even in, um, infusing some of these plastics with uh, aromas, so they actually give off a scent, wow. stuff like that. Wow. So that's a possibility. Uh, other things are that uh, products that are making are called super hydrophobic products. So are you familiar with super hydrophobicity no. at all? Uh, no, I'm not, but could you explain what that is? Okay, sure. So... If a surface is super hydrophobic, that means water just rolls right off it. It's like uh, the lotus flower. So oh. if you ever notice a lotus flower leaf, uh, there's no water on it. It just rolls right off. 
And this is because the surface has like microscopic bumps on it and or microscale bumps on it on top of those bumps are nanoscale bumps. So if you take an eyedropper and put a drop of water on there, it'll just roll up into a ball and just sit on top of the surface. It won't, hmm. it'll just roll off. Wow. And it'll actually take any dirt along with it. So what their uh, researchers are doing is applying to this to like glass. Um, so the glass will be self-cleaning on buildings, for instance, or on automotive windshields. And uh, it would also have the ability to um, keep fo- uh, frost off your windshield or Hot dog. anti-fog. So that's a whole new paradigm right there. I'll say. <laughs> and also clothes. See, like you, uh, they did this. There's a few companies out there that uh, make uh, super hydrophobic clothes, like a sneaker. They poured uh, chocolate syrup on the sneaker. It just rolled right off. Mm, mm, mm. So I, I would need some of that when I'm eating my ice cream. Oh, same here. I'm, I'm a... Are you, are you an ice cream? <laughs> when I eat, stuff goes flying all over the place. <laughs> so, so do I. So help me. I have. I'm a two. I'm a two napkin man. I don't... <laughs> right. Just two. Yeah, it's two. Yeah, that's all. I'd like to have three every now and then, but I don't know where right to on. put the third one. Maybe on top well, of my head. Depends if there's a beer involved or not, right? Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> that's true. So there's also a super hydrophilic, which is the opposite of. Uh, oh, but going just going back to the super hydrophobic. So how they found this is there's a, a beetle in Nambia in the desert there that has its back has a surface like that. So it actually catches fog droplets on its back, and it kind of leans down, and it rolls down into its mouth. Mm, mm. Is that crazy or what? Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, so a lot of these things co- actually come from nature, and that's called uh, biomimetics. So they take... Uh, really kind of look, take a close look at how nature is doing things, just kind of emulate that in, you know, synthetically the way, or the way we think we can do it. So super hydrophilic is the opposite of <clears throat> super hydrophobicity in that water will just spread out on a surface. So you put a drop of water, it will just flatten right out into a whole, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole area. And, um, uh, some other effects are antibacterial surfaces, so they use something called colloidal silver that they coat a surface with, and um, it just kind of destroys bacteria on contact. And there are also a, there's this coating uh, called microbial shield. So think, if you will, of a sword, but it's actually made out of atoms, like there's a molecule that looks like a sword. And there is a nitrogen atom right at the sword where the handle meets the sword. And there are other atoms up at top that actually, because of the negative charge as opposed to a positive charge, it actually draws a bacteria onto the sword and just kind of explodes it when it hits the, the nitrogen atom. So there's all kinds of stuff like that going on that most people don't about. No, you know, I wish I, you know, <laughs> if these were in the hospitals today, what a difference it might make. Yeah. I'm I very, think it's I'm very. To, uh, can you imagine, you know, bed cheese, everything could be, you know, be infused with this stuff to, yeah. uh, to get rid of, uh, keep the bacteria down and viruses down. So you can also use uh, nanotechnology to enhance the flavors of foods through colloidal suspensions, they call them. And it's just like, uh, little bags of, um, you know, not polymers, but uh, lipids, different things that they can, uh, it's just all a matter of scale that can uh, actually enhance the, the flavors of foods, bring them out, make them more tart or more uh, sour or whatever. Other applications are filtering dirty water or even seawater hmm. using a, a nanomaterial called graphene. That, would, that, could, air. That, could save Sorry, the, that could save the world right there. Oh, yeah, there's, there's if you so could clean up That's water. That's what kind of blew my mind about this to begin with. It's just totally limitless. I mean, this would be my job description for the rest of my days, for sure. Uh, no, well, you know, <laughs> There's just geez. too much to do. <laughs> you know, we're, we're having more and more serious problems with water. I don't know where we're going to get our cleaner water. And so this, this really could make a difference and also could prevent wars. Uh, you Absolutely. know, having, having this technology in, in Egypt... Or Israel, or wherever. So, yes. my gosh, this is such a blessing. Really, well, it yeah, is, we, Frank. We just need to all get on the same page because uh, there it can really 
honestly change worlds. So that's that's why I think it's so exciting. And the more people that get on board and learn about it and actually start applying it, uh, we can I hopefully uh, solve a lot of our issues. Well, you know, clean up our whole world and everything. That would be fantastic. It really would. And especially for the children, because they've, they're going oh, yeah. to have it as rough, as much rougher than we had. And, and we're not ready for it. I mean, we, we see our weather changing, and we're not doing much about that. And we know what that means in the future to with places like Louisiana and, and Houston and Florida and other places. Exactly. They, with the kind of water and the filth that's going to come in and, and does come in with that kind of water is deadly. It's really deadly. Oh, yeah. Look at poor Puerto Rico still. Oh, boy. Yeah, they're still working on getting their power back, I think, as well. Right? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, even even though the uh, state of Maryland has, has been sending out 20 and 30 groups of individuals to Puerto Rico to help out. But, you know, they their, their electricity still crashes. Jeez. Well, I'm sorry to get into this, but but that's why when I heard about what you were doing and then read reading most of your book, I realized this is such a gem, such an important oh, well, piece Appreciate of work it. and coming at a time when, you know, I know how you're how dedicated you are to this. So I don't think you're no I don't think anyone's going to be able to buy you off. And you know what I mean by that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a... Oh, no, I've got the best interests of humanity on my brain. That's for correct. Sure. That, and that's what we need. Okay, well... Well, what, yeah, we're trying to... Well, what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, get a... I'll get into this later, but we're trying to get, like, a un, united front happening uh, across the globe to actually start really affecting these changes and, and making good stuff happen. Well, then, let's, so, let's, let's talk about this uh, book, this first book. Yeah, sure. And what the impetus was for writing it. Yeah, so the impetus for writing it, like I started writing out all these uh, concepts on nanomedicine and how I thought it would uh, change things for the better and um, connected with all these people all over the, all these researchers all over the world. And some of them mentioned to me, says, well, if you really want to be taken seriously, you should add references to everything you say. So it's always got a backup. Yeah. Otherwise, people will just think you're just kind of spouting off the top of your head and, you know, you can't, can you actually prove that this is the case, you know, for anything you write? And that made sense to me. So <clears throat> that kind of became the impetus for writing my book. And I thought it was important to get my ideas out there to perhaps inspire discussion and development of advanced uh, nanomedical devices and systems to be a benefit for the world, essentially. Mm -hmm. So the first chapter of my book is what I, I describe uh, one of my nanomedical concepts. It's called the Vascular Cartographic Scanning Nano Device, or VCSN. And I kind of use that as an exemplar for the whole book, uh, just as a you know an, an example and uh, of what an advanced autonomous nanomedical device would uh, look like and what it would do. And... Uh, so in subsequent chapters, I get into ingress and egress, like how these things would actually get into a, the human body, what it would do when it's in there, and how it would actually get out. So you can actually look at these devices as almost like a military mission. Like you're in for a mission, you can go in for half an hour, and then they would go out, uh, either through natural processes or they could... Uh, <clears throat> go through your circulation to your nail beds, like your fingernail beds or toenail beds, and just grow out that way. They just power down and go out that way or through your hair. There's many different ways of going in and out of the body, so I explore this. I also look at uh, energy harvesting and generation, how these things would be propelled through the body, like uh, flagella is like a little tail that whips through. That's how you know sperm work. That's how different uh, bacteria work. And uh, there's a certain way, like at that scale, you're talking about if you if you and I were micro scale, like blood would be like molasses, like trying to swim through molasses. So there's like the scallop theorem. You can't have anything that's uh, reciprocal, like waving back and forth, or you just won't get anywhere. So it has to be kind of like a a corkscrew or a propeller or some kind of thing. And nature has done this exquisitely already. So that's the other thing about nanotechnology is that it's already happening in our bodies right now. 
In what way? To uh, different molecules and stuff like that. Oh, I see. Sorry, go ahead. I was, uh, was going to ask you, what, in what way is it uh, operating in our bodies right now? Okay, well, just in our cells, there are things called uh, ribosomes. They are crazy little uh, two-part machines. They actually come together and they transcribe uh, our DNA and they start making proteins. They start folding proteins just automatically. Hmm. And the proteins fold up automatically just by virtue of their uh, positive and negative charges and the, on the elements of these uh, amino acids that they're comprised of. So you have that going on. There's another nanomachine called the kinesin. Kinesin is like a, it's a two-legged little creature. <laughs> it actually walks on these things called microtubule uh, filaments that actually give uh, structural integrity to our cells. So they walk back and forth of these things, carrying cargo back and forth like all day long, like millions of them in each one of our cells. Like we have no idea what's going on in our own body. Yeah, like that is true. nanotechnology at work already. It sounds like a bunch of ants working all the time. <laughs> yeah, but way smaller than ants. Yes, way smaller. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... So I just uh, in the first few chapters of my book, I discover uh, I explore all these these things, including uh, computation and communications, like how these uh, nano robotics will uh, actually communicate with the outside world. They'd still be under uh, total uh, computer control by the surgeons and physicians that are working what I call out body, like they'd be out of the body. So the middle part of the book is comprised of seven chapters that are contributed by researchers who are actually working in the laboratory on nanomedical devices. So I mm -hmm. thought that'd be a good thing to do after I'm, you know, talking about all this conceptual stuff to have people that are actually doing this and yeah. getting the first, uh, you know, the first iterations of these things actually happening. I found that very helpful. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it kind of brings it, brings it down to earth. A that's bit. right. That's right. When you're, you know, you can actually kind of feel feel the uh the people from that standpoint yes. you know um i've seen bibliographies before but yours is just incredible uh, after oh. every every after every chapter you you've got pages and pages of references it certainly would satisfy anyone who has any questions about this this is an all yeah, in one idea. this like, is, I, was, I, was I didn't know machine. this I didn't know this when we when I first started, you know, when we first started talking about this. But, you know, it, it, this is quite an education, and it it can be fun. It really can, even though oh, some some words I can't possibly pronounce. And uh, <laughs> well, it just takes practice. <laughs> well, maybe so, maybe so. Yeah, that first word was autodidactically. Autodidactically, oh I've yes, it a thousand times. That's why I know that's that just means you taught yourself. Like I have my high school education. People think I'm a PhD, but no, I'm a high school, a proud high school graduate. But I was just uh, totally passionate about this. And you know, once you're passionate about something, there are no bounds. You can just, um, just it's, like I say, I was on a mission, and you just you just keep on going until until it gets done. And that's one of the but reasons. Actually, but that's Sorry? one of the reasons that why we're going to be uh, awarding you a PhD in from what's the matter you? What's the matter you? Love it. <laughs> As our friends at Bullwinkle, on my wall. we we did a lot of special shows on 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 Bullwinkle and Rocky and Bullwinkle and I used you, to watch you, that hey, all the time. I can wait. Do you, do you remember Pogo? Do you remember Pogo? Oh yes. Yeah, you know, and uh, Pogo and and uh, I just love those. They're they're my heroes. They really they are, uh, and because I, I don't think, especially today, you will ever have another cartoon like Rocky and Bullwinkle because the corporate powers would not allow it, they, yeah, because I, they I, they really got right to the point as to what. Oh yes. Yeah, and, well, and, even and the Three Stooges. Look at the Three Stooges. Like that probably wouldn't be allowed today, and they were pretty wild on each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, nope, we're pretty wild right now. We got to take a break here on Twenty First Century Radio with our guest Frank Beam. Nano medical device and the systems design challenges, possibilities, visions, and that's published by the CRC Press. Available on Amazon.com. Hi, this is Janie Hendricks, sister of Jimi Hendrix, and you are listening to Twenty First Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. 
Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Our guest is Frank Beam. And Frank, I had just learned the most exciting thing. You were, you were a singer. Oh, yes. I was in uh, playing rock and roll full-time for 13 years on the road. Wow. So was I, but I could never play an instrument. Did you play any instrument? We must have missed each other. Yes. <laughs> 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 well, I don't know. I was just hanging out. You know. I was hanging out with Hendrix in those days. Oh, well, <laughs> like one of my that. heroes, man. Well, oh, by yeah, the way, he... by the way, we are sending you uh, a new album. Uh, well, actually, oh. this album came out by Frank, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, Jimi Hendrix album called People, Hell, and Angels. So we'll Very put, cool. put that in your box. That, uh, well, I, I'm so impressed. You're a musician. It's so much. I love musicians. I really oh. do. No, really. Because you know, what, you sure. know what happens when you're in a group. <laughs> you know what happens in your group. It, it, it's such a loving thing when everyone really works together. And That's right. It, it raises your consciousness. It increases your positive health, and and you you just it's a different world altogether. Than what most and you people. have a lot of fun. Oh, oh, God, you have tremendous amounts of fun. Maybe too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if you make it big. It's known you, to happen. When you get, yeah, when you get too big, you don't have as much fun. You, you really yeah, you got to keep a lid on it for yeah, sure. For that's sure. for sure. Well, I guess we've got more important things to talk about right now. And we, what will, what will um, some of the most important and far-reaching applications of nano? technology and nanomedicine be? Okay, well, I'll uh, get to that in a second. There's just two other uh, points I had about the book. Oh, okay. Uh, just to kind of let people know what's what's involved. Like, it took me eight years to write the book. My goodness, yeah. So I was uh, working, like, I'm not bragging or anything. That's just what it took. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I was writing at night uh, after work and then on weekends. So I basically had no life for eight years. And when you commit yourself to something like that, you really got to take a close look and say, okay, am I really going to do this, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So after year six, I'm kind of going, like there were times where I thought, man, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be able to do this. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without the support and love from my family and friends for sure. They just you know, kept me going when I was in those little troughs. I didn't think I was uh, going to do it. And um, But... Just, as I say, if you're passionate about something, you just keep at it and uh, do not give up. That's, that's mm-hmm. my advice to people that are looking to write their first book or, you know, to do anything. Do not give up on your passions and your dreams. Anyway, so just uh, the cover of the book, uh, you notice it's kind of kind of amazing. That was done by Dr. Angelica Domsch. She's in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. It's beautiful. She's an excellent artist, research scientist, and consultant, and she also contributed a chapter to the book. Uh, she used to work for Novartis as a uh, research scientist, and she worked on advanced uh, like holographic contact lenses that would actually detect uh, glucose. So this would help with your type 2 diabetes uh, thing you were just talking about. You can actually sense them with contact lenses. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And the cover image is just about uh, some of the nanomedical devices that I designed, and it's kind of psychologically supposed to give you the impression that uh, the applications are limitless. So that's just so I can explain that. Yeah, I see. Okay, so what are the most important far-reaching applications? Okay, so I think nanotechnology has the capacity to touch virtually every business sector, every any uh, medical sector. Uh, There's been lots of hype with nanotechnology over the last uh, decade or so, and people are wondering, kind of scratching their heads, like, what happened? And I think what the problem is, the issue is, why it's taking longer is people were expecting nanotech industries to pop up, but it's actually a fundamentally paradigm-shifting technology that's going to underlie all industries. I think that's why it's taking longer, but uh, we can see it seeping into all sorts of, um, as I mentioned, there's over 1,600 products already, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. What's, it's going to be imbued in, in virtually everything uh, down the road, I think. Mm-hmm. 
So in the energy uh, energy sector, um, it's going to change things in that we'll have like a massively distributed energy. So like you won't need a energy grid anymore. I'd say in t it, like the time frame for all this is typically about 10 to 30 years. Because uh, like the technologies are still they're still in their first you know first early iterations, but they're getting more more sophisticated. For instance, solar panels are becoming ever more um, efficient, and uh, you know I'm not sure if they're at parity with uh, with uh, fossil fuels now, but they're getting pretty close, and soon they'll surpass it. So it'll be you'll be able to uh, essentially print your own solar panels in your own home. And use those uh, also sophisticated batteries and all kinds of stuff. I'll get into that a bit later. But uh, so it also has the capacity to clean, completely clean and then reinvigorate the environment, uh, get rid of all the plastics in the oceans. You, I'm sure you're familiar with the oh, yes. what problem Pacific they Gyre, they call it. It's uh, like bigger than Texas or even bigger than that now. Yeah, yeah. I believe. But uh, that has to be taken care of, all those microplastics. If we could find – actually, somebody just did found some kind of a enzyme that loves eating that plastic. Oh, great. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's, set them up. That would, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, so, you know, you just put all these little uh, enzymes out there that start eating this stuff. That would be, that would be excellent. And, of course, the CO2, if we can uh, – help to uh, suck the CO2 out of the uh, environment, out of the air, and convert it into building materials, as I said, or just convert it into some other product that can be used, uh, you know, kind of benignly. Uh, there's also a thing called molecular manufacturing. Now, this is in, uh, it was first uh, brought to light by Richard Feynman again in 1959 as he was talking about making smaller things with bigger uh, machines. Mm -hmm. And it was also um, brought to light by uh, Eric Drexler in his book, Engines of Creation. He talked about a molecular assembler that would actually put things together atom by atom. And he even talked about uh, making a jet engine in a vat of liquid with these molecular assemblers with all the ingredients necessary, and they're just programmed. They have little quantum computers in them and like this this is conceptual for now but and it would build like a pristine rocket engine right in that vat wow <laughs> so that's what got my my head going on the stuff. You know, that's that was in his first book so i was going wow that's something else man it sure is but i'll get into the molecular manufacturing a bit later but it's that's i think is going to be uh world changing for sure so Okay, so one of the uh, most important things, uh, one of the things that could be happening with nanomedicine is two concepts I come up with. The, as I say, the vascular cartographic scanning and antibodies, so I'll, I'll explain that now. So what it would be is a one micron in diameter uh, nanomedical device. It would have its own brain, like a quantum computer, be totally programmed uh, from you know a physician or um, surgeons, after they actually map the whole body. And, you know, probably 10,000 or more of these would uh, be introduced into the human body, like through a patch or through a gel, topical gel, or you would swallow it as a pill. There's many ways of, of getting them in there. They would automatically start scanning your whole vascular turf from top to bottom, like down to capillary level. And they'd map the whole thing, and they'd be done in maybe half an hour. Oh. And then they'd get out of the body. And that information would be translated to, say, a uh, supercomputer, and you'd be able to image your whole vascular system in 3D, or you'd have to be able to have the capacity to fly through the, this whole system to see where there are plaque deposits, or if there is an imminent aneurysm about to happen in your brain or, and stuff like that. Or you could have a holographic rendering. You could just have it right in front of you spinning around, right? Right. So that's, that's the idea of that. Uh, the precursor to this would, is what I call the gastro, uh, mic, um, gastrointestinal micro-scanning device. So this would be like a pill-sized thing that you would swallow, and you'd have like a little patch on the side of your belly. And uh, for the next few days, this thing would just go through your body and just uh, inertly just go along with the peristaltic motion of your uh, gastrointestinal system. 
and uh, would map the whole thing, and all the data would be transmitted to that little patch. So that little patch, and when it's done, uh, after two days, and you just go about your normal business, you take the patch off, you plug it into a computer like a USB stick, and you'd have the whole your whole uh, GIT kind of rendered there, same kind of thing. But that's an earlier stage, which be which would be uh, much simpler to. Uh, Get going. Hey, how would it would it be effective with ileitis colitis? It, it would help. Well, it, this would just be a, a diagnostic tool. Like there are other things that could actually treat things, but this would just be mapping it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's uh, let's distinguish that. There are other other uh, things you could use to actually um, repair all, all sorts of uh, ailments. So another uh, application, a big application. That I cover in my book too is um, massive augmentation of your immune system uh, through a device called called the Sentinel. The Sentinel would act as a it would basically attack and destroy any non-self entity that enters your body. So it would be it would have a whole database in its uh, in its little com computer brain, and anything that it doesn't recognize. Even if it's unknown, it'll just destroy it, like a toxin or some kind of bug or whatever. But it knows not to touch anything healthy that's supposed to be there. So that could help us with a lot of things, like never getting the flu, never getting any kind of sickness, um, you know, and actually help help us live longer and things like that. So that's that's another thing, and then that moves on to longevity itself. So longevity, there's this uh, substance. One of the one of the uh, things that have been looked at. Uh, this is started by Aubrey de Grey. He's in the, in the UK, and I've been in touch with him uh, once in a while, and we've been discussing this. Uh, we're gonna there's need just... to we're gonna need to pause now, and we'll return. Oh, yeah, no problem. We'll return. I just I just go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want you to go on and on because this is such such important stuff. This is 21st Century Radio, and we'll be back in just a few minutes with our guest, Frank Bean. And our guest is Frank Bean. Nano medical device and systems design, challenges, possibilities, visions, CRC Press. Available on Amazon.com or from the link on the front page of 21stCenturyRadio.com. Learn more about Frank and nanotechnology for medical applications at his website, www.nanoappsmedical.com. All right, so while we were partying away here... <laughs> As we always do. Yes, we do. Have a good In time. Our spare time. Hey, did you did you play a guitar? <laughs> yeah, I play guitar and bass, and uh, we kind of switch back and forth. And uh, yeah, I wrote, wrote lots of songs. I'm still writing songs. And uh, actually, after all these books are done, I'm planning to put out my first CD ever. Oh, well, then you're going to have to join us to play it on the radio here. On right on. 21st century radio. Well, I like to get in your I like to get in your your van there and you know, just travel <laughs> around a bit. <laughs> well, if we got it and you're around, cool. we'll, we'll do something about that. The um uh, the, the by the by the way, since you there are um we are giving you also several guitar picks from Janie Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix guitar picks. Um Really? Yes. That would be awesome. Now he, he now these aren't ones he played with, but these are ones he designed. They were perfectly exactly the same, and that's, that's why fine. His, that's why that's why Janie gave them to us and said, "Look, that is cool. You bump Very into cool. people that like my brother, or really love my brother." And so oh that, yeah, I that's why as I I learned his uh, one of his albums, Note for Note, Cry of Love album. Well, uh, that's it's a challenge, but uh, I stuck at it. But uh, wow, what a player! Well, and what a person too. Oh yeah, he gave a lot of good stuff. To the the world. media, the media never understood this man. As a matter of fact, and that that was one of the biggest problems because the media yeah. uh, was more or less looking at his hair and his clothes and this and that and these and those, and didn't pay attention to what he was saying, nor his oh, kindness. He was giving love out, man, everywhere. Yes, he was. He was fine. Oh, oh well, we've got to stop this now. I'm sorry about that. But I'm sorry. Okay, we're on. Were we finishing up? Yes, yes, we were finishing. Oh yeah, yeah. So I was, I was mentioning Aubrey de Grey. So he's in the UK, 
And uh, we were talking about longevity. Like he's he's been espousing longevity for quite some time now. And he started the Sens Foundation. Um, he was quoted one time saying that if we just took out the garbage in our cells, like kept them clean, we could live up to a thousand years. Wow. So that kind of blew my mind. I went, okay, yeah, how would that possibly happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so anyway, one of the things we were looking at, I was looking at it from the nanomedical uh, perspective. He was looking at it from the biochemistry perspective. But there's a substance called lithofusion. It's like a waxy heterogeneous, which means it's in, got a lot of different components into it. It's like a waxy substance, and it builds up. It's like a meta- metabolic um, end product of your lysosomes. So lysosomes are these things in your cells. They're one of the organelles in your cells. They're like the garbage disposal units. So it takes apart different uh, elements that the cell no longer leads, and it puts it in there, and it has about a complement of about 50 different enzymes, and it can break it all down into you know, very inert uh, elements. So Aubrey was thinking of a way to get rid of this diffusion, and by doing so, could you rejuvenate the, the question was, could you rejuvenate the cells, and then by virtue of that, could you rejuvenate the organs, and then hence the person themselves? So he couldn't find any way of getting rid of this stuff, and he kind of had a, a moment uh, and he decided to go to a graveyard. So he went to an old uh, graveyard where the plague victims were buried. My. And uh, took some samples, or had his people take samples. I'm sure he was there too. But they found no lithofusion at all in the ground. <clears throat> so he kind of postulated that there must be some kind of bacteria in the soil that was spewing out enzymes that could actually break down this diffusion. Wow. So what we were talking about is if we could find some kind of soil bacteria and put it into nanomedical devices and target them to these lysosomes, to the cells, we could potentially get rid of this diffusion and rejuvenate the cells and rejuvenate the patient. So that's one area in longevity. That's just one of many that they're looking at that could actually um, increase our lifespan quite dramatically. Oh. So that's just putting out the garbage. Yeah. Uh, another thing is uh, from Dr. Robert Friedis Jr. He came up with this concept for total chromosome replacement. So that means they would actually map your chromosomes and replicate it uh, out in the lab. And then they would use nano devices to put them in your cells and totally get rid of the whole complement of the chromosomes in your in your nucleus, replace the whole complement and rejuvenate the cells that way. Wow. You know, it sounds kind of extreme, but in the in the age of nanomedicine and that technology, like when it's mature, that'll be kind of a regular occurrence. Sounds but, like uh, a brave new world. Uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be different. <clears throat> for sure. So there's, there's, those are some of the more long-term um, possibilities. There's also the aspect that this is why I'm writing these uh, all these books now because it's I kind of look at them as a preemptive uh, heads up to what's going on downstream, and we should actually start thinking about this seriously and uh, devising strategies and, uh, you know, regulations and stuff like that, just so we can kind of keep some modicum of control on this stuff. Because mm-hmm. with any powerful technology, as you know, there are uh, possibilities for to go either way with it. But what we want to do is accentuate and maximize the positives and minimize the negatives, of course. Of course. So, so there's the aspect of us melding with technologies, with our technologies, which is what we're already doing. Like, you just look at the everybody walking around with their cell phones it's like an extension of their brain now yeah uh myself <laughs> but uh you know and it's going to get to the point where it's actually going to start well people have already started making themselves cyborgs they have you know those implants all over the place 
And uh, beyond the medical, though, some people are just doing it for human augmentation reasons. Like, I remember there's, I forget what his name was, he actually had some kind of a uh, little light or something coming out of the back of his head. I'm not sure who that was, but something like that. But humans are an adventurous species, for sure. So then we're getting into the transhumanist uh, movement, which is happening all over the place now as well. And they want to, they think we should totally... Uh, integrate ourselves with uh, technologies just so we don't get overrun by like AI and Elon Musk is the same. He's, that's what he's kind of proposing. So we can't really, if we just keep ourselves the way we are, <coughs> AI is just going to be kind of supersede us and we'll be lost in the dust. So he kind of, and others say that we should kind of um, melt with them. Hmm. <laughs> so, those are some of the um, far-reaching applications of nanomedicine that just off the top of my head. <laughs> well, could you tell us about your startup company, Nano sure. Apps Medical, and why you formed it, and what the sure. aims of the company are? Sure. Uh, Nano Apps uh, was formed. I formed it in 2009 to uh, begin developing advanced nanomedical devices, uh, diagnostic and therapeutic devices to help both the developing and developed worlds. We did a bit of uh, preliminary work in 2009, 2010 with uh, magnetic nanoparticles with a small grant. <clears throat> but then uh, it kind of laid dormant for a number of years while I was writing my book and uh, you know working. So as I said, I had a period of eight years there where I was, that's all I was doing. So trying to get the funding for the company was not on the not on the charts at that time. So what happened? Uh, let me see. In 2016, I drove across the country from Thunder Bay to Vancouver, which is where I am now, and I connected uh, with a woman called Amanda Scott. She works for Alias Studio in Sydney, Australia. So we started collaborating, and we kind of uh, together we brought NanoApps back to life through our uh, NanoApps medical site. And Amanda did an amazing job in creating the uh, site and continues to improve and maintain it uh, with daily news, Twitter, Tumblr, and so on. So we got to the point now, um, it's about two years now we've had it going. Uh, we're one of the top 50 nanotech blogs on the net, which is pretty cool. Huh? Yeah, I'll say. So she is now director of, uh, she's director of communications and marketing for uh, NanoApps Medical. We have another of partners on the team as well that are at uh, various academic and medical fa facilities who have a wide range of expertise in nanotechnology, nanomedicine, uh, clinical medicine, uh, electronics, photonics, electrochemistry, and nanomaterials. So we have a really good team. I've kind of assembled that over the last uh, you know, five years or so. So we have multiple projects that we're looking to uh, secure funding for right now. But it's been a challenge because it seems to be kind of like a really very risk-averse funding environment, particularly as it relates to these new technologies because maybe they don't kind of understand what's, what the, the implications are and the, and the massive potential for these things. Uh, but there's, that's what I found. Just It's been a struggle trying to get uh, this stuff funded. So it's like a catch-22 because um, some funders want a prototype IP patents in place before they will fund anything. But you need money to actually make the prototype. Like it may take, you know, a fair amount of money just to get to the prototype stage because it, it takes work and you got to verify that things work and things like that. Sure. What kind, what kind of ballpark figure would you need to really to do these kind of things economically? Well, we're looking at uh, some sensors now that would be able to detect various diseases uh, using things other than blood. Um, just a very basic thing would be about 500K, but, uh, you know, some of the more uh, elaborate things that would have even more um, applications would probably start from one to three million, something like that. Mm -hmm. But research is not cheap. I mean, well, you know, if you're dealing with these... Uh, facilities and laboratories everybody wants to get paid and have salaries and you know have a have the uh some stability in what they're doing of course of course yeah absolutely so we're what we're doing what we're looking to do now is align with individuals and entities who are willing to take the risk involved with 
development of these things. Uh, they're potentially very powerful technologies, and they have strong potential, I think, to change many paradigms for, uh, toward positively shaping our future as humanity. That's what I uh, think, and I think that's worth investing in. I think I think so too, and the more the uh, the the public knows about this, and and, yes. and and the media knows about this, the better, because they're going to be thrilled. Sure. They're going. This is so thrilling. I mean, uh, F- Frank, I am so proud of you. Oh, uh, well, hey, I'm proud of you too. <laughs> I know, but but look, I know what it. T- it's taken me. It took me, and my producer knows this. 30 years, 30 years to do the book on the Yellow Submarine. Wow. 30 years of... And, that is a long time. It is a hell of a long time. Uh, and, and, well, that's tenacity, you know, that's for sure. And, 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 and also some of the murals that I've done, which have taken years to do. Uh, but and, and I know what it takes to stick through something, even though you may not even have the money to stick through it. Because <laughs> <That>, oh. <laughs> artists are always in this ter- terrible situation. We'll do the work, but you got to eat at the same time. That's right. And you got to right. pay for this and that and these and those. And so it takes very special people that can uh, care enough to forego yeah. the kind of things that most people absolutely need. And that's the one. That's why I'm proud of you. And I'm. I'm, I'm well, thanks very much. Because there, well, I think you know. Bob, Dr. Bob, I think everybody actually is capable of doing things like uh, writing a book or whatever. It's, they just have to find their passion, first of all. Yeah. And find out what you don't want to do, first of all. And then, uh, you know, kind of find your dream and uh, just get at it and stick at it. And as I said, don't, don't ever give up. Well, we're finding right now that we have to take a break here on 21st Century Radio with our guest, Frank Beam. Nanomedical device. This is Dr. Richard Bartlett, founder of Matrix Energetics, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Uh, well, we're aiming to, uh, like, we're starting with the early, um, you know, applications of uh, nanomedicine, which will be the easiest, like the lowest hanging fruit, I think, would be the diagnostic end because you're not, uh, you know, not putting anything in the body, which will take uh, much longer to, you know, get FDA clearance and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, just to get the ball rolling, we'd like to get into these diagnostics uh, and get these things going. So we're, we're still working to try and get funding here in North America. But in addition to that, we're setting up the uh, uh, NanoApps Medical Affiliated Entity in uh, Europe in association with a person we have there on the ground. And uh, the... What's happening right now, uh, the EU is very aggressively funding innovation and future technologies. So we would certainly like to be a part of that and uh, contribute to this effort. So we're kind of uh, expanding out. Uh, NanoApps is kind of like the main company, but there's going to be a lot of uh, strategic partners uh, working on various aspects like uh, AI and space and things like that. So we're kind of um, getting things set up where we can touch a lot of areas in a positive way. Well, and it seems like uh, Europe is is uh, moving much, well, much more rapidly ahead than we are in this particular country, especially dealing with health care. They're moving it over there for sure. Yeah, they really are, and we're just falling so far behind. If I may, what, what needs to happen is we need, we're on this little blue planet, we need all to work together. We're going to hope to have a better future for our, our children, our grandchildren. Like we're getting to a crisis point now, so we can't can't fool around. No, nope, you're right. That's my opinion. Yeah. Now you are currently working on three new books. Would you mm-hmm. describe them and tell us why you are writing the first two in parallel? That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Well, actually, I've got lots of help this time. So my first book, I wrote probably ten chapters on my own. Uh, with these next three books, I'll probably have more than 20 or 30 contributing authors. So thank God. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's a big help, all right. But also, these books actually lend themselves to this because I want a lot of uh, diverse opinions uh, from all, all sorts of people. So that's that's, uh, that's going to be a good fit, I think. 
Yeah. So anyway, the first book is called Nanomes, uh, Nanotechnology, Nanomedicine, and AI Toward the Dream of Global Healthcare Equivalency. This is kind of like my larger vision of where I see this all going, like nanomedicine, nanotechnology, and artificial intelligence. I think it'll one of the one of the applications is going to coalesce, and the synergies between them may may give rise to what I call global healthcare equivalency in the next 10 to 30 years. So the premise of this is no matter how wealthy or impoverished you are, no matter where you happen to reside on the planet or under what conditions you live, you have the same high quality, not a medical health care, mm-hmm. like a universal worldwide health care system. So progress toward this goal will be incremental, and uh, but each successive wave of not a medical technologies will be more advanced than the previous wave. But uh, it's going to kind of... The tipping point will be where um, molecular manufacturing comes onto the stage. So molecular manufacturing is actually the ability to build things at the atomic with atomic precision. So we look at today's 3D printers. Those are like the early stages of this, and I think molecular manufacturing will, will be the progeny. So imagine like a microwave-type uh, device in your house. I call them a factory-at-home system. And you'd be able to print your running shoes, your toothbrush, your food, uh, gourmet meals, uh, plus your sophisticated nanomedical devices that are prescribed by your physician in your own home. Uh, so, I'm, watching, I'm watching my producer shake her head right now. <laughs> <laughs> You just, you just well, to get it. The I mean, bottom line is everything is made of atoms, right? Including that's us. right. That's we are right. we are aggregates of atoms. We're just put together John in a Adams. certain way that we actually work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the same with a potato or anything else. It just matters how these atoms are arranged and how they function with each other that gives functionality to whatever it is they're made of. Like, you know, you have a, a rock and you have a plant and you have like just increasing uh, complexity gives of the atomic structure gives rise to different things until we reach things like DNA, which, you know, gives us us and all, all sorts of animals and all the, all the, uh, the biodiversity on the planet. Anyway, so this, if, if this global health care currency comes online, it um, has potential to significantly reduce uh, the perception of individuals in the developing world of being marginalized, at least in terms of their health care. This may ultimately translate to conflict reduction, I think, because they won't feel so, you know, out of it. They'll be actually included in, in having top-tier health care as well. And there's nothing better than a healthy population to, you know, get, get the countries rolling because there'll be a uh, lot less um, losses in missed days and uh, lost uh, productivity due to sickness and health. So in the developing, in the developed world, I think global health care equivalency will have the effect of dramatically reducing health care expenditures across the board. So these, because um, molecular manufacturing can make these things so cheaply, um, that's why I think it would be uh, able to be expanded globally. Well, that's that's the one of the great things about this this system, in the sense that you're really looking out for those who really have no health care at all around the world. That's right. And that's right. you you uh, you haven't touched on it yet, but I'm sure uh, you will later. If we I got time, as to the importance of of how you have been able to cut the costs of various um, high tech technology uh, mm-hmm. and and to make it possible for the poor really to receive the health care because the great thing about this is you know your support of diversity which is what the world it is that kind of diversity of bringing people together will create in my opinion what basically would be referred to as caring and love for each other. When the rest of the poorer world realizes that America, with the heart that it has had in the past, and in the past, mm-hmm. not today, but in the past, always helping others, always going out there and looking out for the underdog, that that's one of the things 
if you don't mind my saying, this is very Christly. And I don't mean that just in the religious sense. It's the kind of thing that uh, I believe what holy men have been talking about forever. And that is looking mm-hmm. out for everyone instead of the wealthy, instead of just the billionaires. Because the billionaires mm-hmm. can afford when any kind of health care they want. No wonder. So things will obviously change because a lot of the health care systems are in disarray or they're just totally dysfunctional or they don't exist at all on the planet right now. So... Another aspect of this is, you know, in contrast to our natural, inalienable human rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, our equally important right to good health, and by extension of this, good health care, which is critical for all of us, is is uh, dysfunctional. So we got to get that back on track, I think. And we are struggling with uh, these health care systems worthwhile, uh, worldwide. And as you know, there are massive expenditures for drugs. Like some of these pills cost a thousand dollars a piece, or yeah, yeah. You know, families are struggling for a hundred thousand dollar a year in drug expenses. That's like, I don't think that's sustainable. No, it isn't sustainable. But we see it almost every day. Yes, it's it's. So what I propose is like a, an inclusive program. We need like we need to work together. I think. Uh, so I just have <clears throat> a quote here from the World Bank and. Uh, the World Health Organization, they say that half the world lacks access to essential health services. 100 million people are still pushed into extreme poverty because of health expenses. And the WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Chan, she mentions uh, in one of her quotes, uh, in a world facing considerable uncertainty, international health development is a unifying and uplifting force for the good of humanity. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an apt description of what the essence of what global health care currency could be. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. One of these days we're going to say something I don't agree with. When's that going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I know when it will be. Which was which of Jimi oh, Hendrix's we'll songs be was no the worries. best? I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big fight we're going to get into. <laughs> yeah, I wanted that guitar pick. <laughs> now, why, why, you know, you're writing three books. Um, why write these books now? These oh, yeah. So, books. okay. So I'm writing the two together, uh, the one on glo- um, molecular manufacturing. That's going to change, like, everything, I think. is going to change the way we manufacture things, as I just mentioned. It's going to be massively distributed. Now, keep in mind, this is 10 to 30 years down the road. So the reason I'm writing it now, because, as we know, technologies are advancing so quickly. And especially with the advent of artificial intelligence, it will be changing exponentially as uh, Ray Kurzweil predicts. Just because we have all these, uh, you know, supercomputers and everything, we'll be able to very quickly figure out different uh, pathways or the wrong pathways that we should go in any general area. So that's what I think is going to happen. But uh, so global healthcare equivalency, so I'm writing these books as a preemptive um, heads up to kind of, hopefully get people to start thinking about this, these things and discussing them because they're, I think they're going to be coming downstream pretty quickly. So we can actually regulate them and kind of uh, assess what the positives and negatives are and kind of maximize uh, the the good for humanity, really, for this. Yeah, yeah. It's going to take a lot of work for me, but there's no... <laughs> of course. Order. I mean, such a huge... <clears throat> Massive undertaking uh, will take sustain, sustained, uh, high-spirited collaboration uh, from people with widely varied backgrounds, diverse areas of expertise, and you know, highly specialized laboratories, administrative institutions, regulatory bodies, government agencies all have to work together to kind of make this uh, happen. So, what I'm hoping is to kind of get a united front. Uh, happening on this and like almost like a movement with like-minded individuals who see that this might be a good idea to have global health care. I'll say. As it yeah. actually benefits each of us. Mm-hmm. So like we each have our own unique talents, I think, and expertise that we could devote to this. It's I think it's really noble enterprise. And um, I think it could really help us and it could 
what I, uh, what I mentioned it as an inalienable right of uh, human of optimal health for life. It should be. Yeah. That's kind of like the prerequisite for all the other uh, rights that we have. Yeah. So if you're not healthy, you can't fully, you know, fulfill your life with all these other aspects. No, you can't. Well, no. the one aspect that keeps coming up is commercials, and ah. we, we got <laughs> they're coming right about now, and our time is running out. We got about twenty some minutes, so we got to. Now move into them right now, and we'll be seeing you, Frank, in just a few minutes. Hello, this is Dr. John Brandenburg, nuclear physicist and author of Life and Death on Mars on 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. 21st Century Radio, your source for the hidden truths of reality. Okay, Frank. Um, Hello. Yes, yes, Frank. <laughs> Are you sitting up straight and, no, and, and paying oh, yeah. attention? It's a good thing. Oh, yes, of course, always. <laughs> but you're not chewing gum, are you? No, 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 no time. <laughs> no time. No time to chew gum. Okay. Now, what might the moral, ethical, and social aspects be of C- GHCE, and that would be global health care equivalency, mm. uh, and MM, that's not Marilyn Monroe, but molecular manufacturing, right and on. B slash CI, which is brain cloud interface. Oh, yeah. I should... Just touch on that for a moment, if you don't mind. Please do. Yeah, so the third book is going to be called Nanomedical Brain Cloud Interface, Explorations and Implications. So this is an in-depth exploration of, uh, like I'm actually working on two papers right now with 10 different co-authors that explore this. So this is going to be an expansion of these papers uh, that explores a hypothetical possibility that the cerebral cortex of the human brain could be seamlessly, safely, and securely connected with the cloud as a brain cloud interface. So this would be as opposed to uh, brain implants, whatever. These would be small, micron-scaled nanomedical devices that you wouldn't even perceive as being in your your body, like a red blood cell or, you know, is eight eight microns in diameter, some cells are even up to 30 microns in diameter, and we don't know that they're even there. So you want this to be totally imperceptible. They will actually act as an antenna for your brain to the, if you want to, this is totally voluntary, of course, mm-hmm. <laughs> to the uh, to the cloud. And this is also, I, I'm just kind of moving on from uh, Ray Kurzweil, who actually initially uh, discussed this possibility that nanobots would connect our brains to the uh, the cloud to kind of give us the access to the full human knowledge. And uh, I kind of get into some different other concepts, uh, applications of this uh, as well. But uh, so one of the things I just want to cover is a thing called uh, transparent shadowing. Oh, yes, please do. So this would be uh, on a permission-based or fee-based um, seminar, if you will. Okay, I'll use the example of a carpenter. Say a carpenter wants to show us how to make a dovetail joint. We don't know anything about it. So if we all have these, um, these brain cloud interface uh, units, we could actually, with his permission or her permission, would actually inhabit their, their bodies. But they would know. They would not know we were there. We would have no access to their emotions or uh, self-speak or anything like that. But they, you would feel everything that they are feeling. You'd smell the smell of the sawdust. You'd smell the glue, and you'd feel the wood, the texture of the wood, and all that stuff. So that's what we call transparent shadowing, and that could have m- uh, many applications, uh, and it actually might actually make us put put ourselves in somebody else's shoes so you'd actually have their experience wow that so that could be beneficial i I'll think say, in a lot of, a lot of respects. i'll say you know it. you could this is what it's like to be a street person this is what it's like to you know being in battle somewhere this is what it's like to be a pilot you know there's all kinds of, of applications so that's one of the things we're covering in that but we're also looking at all the uh, moral, sociological, ethical, philosophical implications, because just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. So this is another reason why I'm getting these uh, these books out here, so we can everybody can start discussing these things and whether we should do it, and if so, 
how can we maximize the positives again? And, uh, you know, how can we make them secure that they're not, um, you know, hacked by nefarious, uh, nefarious sources, you know, for mind control and all that stuff. We don't want that. <laughs> right. Of course not. So, yeah. So that's, that's discovered that. And each of these technologies will likely be underpinned as you've heard of blockchain probably, uh, that's a really hot topic right now. It's uh, along, along with cryptocurrencies. But I think each of these technologies will be underpinned and driven by blockchain technologies because they can verify and record every transaction and keep it all organized and could actually uh, negate the hacking and corruptions of the systems. And plus, also, these systems will be generating massive amounts of data. So it will actually accommodate or facilitate their seamless uh, operation. Okay, that's all I have to say about that one. <laughs> well, you know, uh, one of the one of the thrilling. I mean, there are several thrilling areas in your book, but the one book area that I found thrilling was when you started talking about uh, nano medicine in space applications. Wow, right what a difference! Wow, talk to us about that, please. Sure. So one of the concepts that came up for this is what I call the interskin. <clears throat> the interskin would be like a bodysuit that would be a liner of a spacesuit, and it would be interfaced with your skin. It would actually uh, monitor you 24-7 or whenever you had it on, and uh, would be able to actually, if you were in trouble, would be able to administer therapeutics. Uh, your helmet would also have, like, a, you get your brain scanned in there. And, um, you know, it's just essentially a, um, on board, you're wearing your whole medical facility on your body. And it would continually monitor you. And uh, the beauty of this is, uh, for space travel, is it's uh, compact. It uh, would be sophisticated, lightweight, which would be a perfect um, alignment with space travel because that's, that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could also have medical sick bays on uh, spacecraft for this and, you know, medical bays on uh, lunar and Mars habitats. So that's another prong we're hoping to get funding for is to start getting nanomedicine happening in uh, space, space applications, because uh, it has capacities for, like nanotechnology, nanomaterials have capacities for uh, reducing radiation, like cosmic rays coming in and... and uh, messing up with the uh, the body and the DNA. There are also, you know, I cover in my book, uh, there are enhanced nanomedical DNA protection and repair mechanisms that can be brought about by uh, nanomedical devices. And if necessary, chromos chromosome replacement, like we were discussing earlier. And uh, it could possibly positively affect the uh, physio physiological effects of uh, microgravity, which there's about 40 different things that go wrong with the body because of just because of uh, microgravity. Yeah, that was the so, section that was the section that uh, I I was really shocked about. I I did not realize what happens to the bones. Oh yeah, I was uh, shocked and, too. And, oh, well, jeez, no wonder we didn't put our men back on the ship and send them back to the moon or 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 oh. attempt to Mars because I'll, I'll let you take on that because I don't want to I had a, I had the honor of meeting uh meeting uh Chris Hatfield uh, a couple of years ago, he was the commander of the space station for a while, and he's been up on a couple uh, mini shuttle uh, crafts. And he was actually the, I think, the only North American that knew how to fly a Soyuz spacecraft. But I had really, uh, like, I shook his hand and said, "Man, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, how do you do that?" Just blew my mind. And he, like, he, he's, I guess, fluent in Russian as well, so he had to learn Russian like over 20 years or something. Just. It's amazing to me what uh, humans can do when they really are passionate about something, that's for sure. Brave new world. Oh, yeah. And in a really positive way, too, because it obviously it by bringing health care to the world will make... Yes. Well, I, I imagine it will eliminate wars. People will not uh, fall for the, 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 the story that they must kill and uh, to, to, to survive. Exactly. And, and that really is a great blessing um, because, it, you know, it, it, uh, war, we have, in, we're incessantly at war in America, and that's where so much of our money goes. 
Yes. Uh, and it should be going into more peaceful things, but we can't aren't doing that. And, and it looks like uh, there's some people even searching for wars right now uh, mm-hmm. to, 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 to build uh, their, their own confidence in themselves. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I think this is such an important work, because it, it, it gets to the point where back in 1968, we had a phrase for it, and it was basically... We are one people on one planet. Absolutely. On a very, very small planet. <laughs> and a very, yes, on a very small planet. Plus, plus the uh, odds of us not being here at all are immense. So it's just a miracle to me that we're here to begin with. And while we're here for such a finite time, why don't we make the best of it? For sure. Now, each, you know, there there is this, well, I mean, each of these technologies sound quite disruptive, though, in a certain sense, mm. and paradigm shifting. What of job displacement, changing infrastructures, et cetera? I mean, as far as nanomedicine goes, like things that will change are like there will probably be no longer a need for huge hospitals. It will probably be down to a clinic uh, situation because nobody will actually be staying in hospitals anymore unless it's uh, – like you probably have trauma centers still for, you know, uh, massive accidents or something like that. But as far as taking care of cancer and all that stuff, you could make your uh, cancer eradicating nano devices at home and, you know, under a, a, a physician's prescription and, uh, you know, take care of it right there. Like, so you still need physicians, you still need surgeons. Surgeons right now work with, uh, you know, robotic uh, entities like the Da Vinci uh, medical robot. Boy, I was that was. What I'm thinking is, mm. yeah, you've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, what I'm thinking is a million times smaller than that. Mm-hmm. But they'll still, you'll still need surgeons to actually orchestrate all these, perhaps millions of nano devices uh, in somebody's body to affect positive change. We're we got about a minute left here. What what. Are there any limits to where humanity can go with the virtue of these it's these kind of technologies? Well, I'm sure there are indeed limits. I think we should. Uh, that's we should. That's why we should discuss this to see how far we should actually go. Because, uh, as you know, humans are very adventurous uh, creatures, and they everybody somebody at some point wants to push the boundary just a bit further to see what will happen. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we should actually, I don't think there really are any limits. Um, a lot of limits we have are placed on ourselves. But I think we, it comes to a point we have to think of what's uh, best for humanity, for individuals, and for humanity as, as a whole. Well, with that, you know, I, one of the things I like mostly about yourself is you, you believe in a natural, inalienable right of optimal health for life. Right on. That's Absolutely. terrific. That is terrific. Thank you for joining us, Brother Frank. Oh, you're so uh, welcome. And you know, I hope you, you join us again, whether you're playing the guitar or not. Uh, right on. Thank you very much, Brother Bob. <laughs> Brother <All> right. Michael. <laughs> Brother well, Dr. Bob. <laughs> thank you. And see you guys next week on 20... Actually, Zoe Zo will see you next week. And that's the show. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cordner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington, and I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.